Hi, this is Mori reporting from Berlin, and this is part four of my using React Hooks with D3 series. And in this one, I want to show you how to create an animated bar chart, which looks like this. Uh, it will animate its values on initial render, and it will also update and uh, even change its color values for each bar, uh, depending on the value for each bar. So stay tuned. In the last video, I was adding an uh, X and a Y axis to this uh, line chart. And I was also explaining uh, what scales are and how we were using uh, scale linear to map or scale an input value like 0 to 6, in this case, the index values, to 0 to 300 for the visual representation of our data. For this session, I centered my SVG, as you can see here, and uh, you will see why I did that later. So let's get started. Uh, let's reuse the things we can reuse from our last session. And as I said, I want to render a bar chart this time. So I will go ahead and remove the part where I am rendering a line. And also, I'm going to remove my line generator here. Then I am going to remove these imports. We still need our uh, X and our Y axis, uh, but we actually need to do some adjustments to our X axis. So imagine I want to render a bar chart and I want to render a bar for every tick on the X axis. And if the bar was like 50 pixels wide or something, then I would have to uh, draw it a bit outside of the SVG in this case. And I, then I would have to add like padding and do some math and stuff. And I don't really want to do that. So guess what? D3 provides something uh, called scale ban, which is exactly what we need for this case. And um, to demonstrate this, I will change uh, our X scale, which is a linear scale, to a scale band. And I am going to adjust the domain, which was from 0 to 6, into uh, an array with explicit values like one, two, three, four. So now I have five elements in my domain array. And if I save this, you will see that my X axis now has five ticks. And the way this works is the scale band takes the range I have defined here from zero to 300 and it splits it into five equally wide bands, and that's why it's called a scale band. The reason why uh, it is not showing 0 to 4, but 1 to 5, is because I was formatting the value on my x-axis in the last uh, session, and this I actually don't need. I will just remove this, and now you can see it's again 0 to 4. So the main difference between scale band and scale linear is with scale band, I am mapping um, arbitrary values I have defined here to um, a range of linear values from 0 to 300. So I could even go ahead and say, okay, 15, 26, 37, and 48, for example, and you will still see I have five ticks. And now what is happening is Scale band is mapping 0 to 0, 15 to 60, 26 to 120, and so on. But it does not know how to handle 14 or 16, for example, because these values are not linear. Um, but, but scale linear um, is mapping a linear range of input values to a linear range of output values. So if I were to give an input value of 300 to my uh, Y scale, it would still continue um, this line and return minus 150 to me. So with scale band, I have to be explicit what I want to map to what. And I want to map 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 to these values because these are the index values I'm working with. And to do that, I can also just say, uh, data map uh, value and index, but just return the index value. So now you will see I have an x axis with seven ticks 
from zero to six. So now I can go ahead and draw the um, bars of my bar chart. And for that, I'm going to say SVG, um, select all the existing elements with the class bar in my uh, SVG and synchronize them with the data I'm giving you here. This is the entire data array because I want to create a rectangle element for every piece of data. And then I'm going to say join rect because I want to create a rect element for every piece of data. And then I want to attach the attribute class bar to every entering and updating um, element in my SVG. So um, this is important, the, the attachment of this um, class name is important so that the bar elements can update. And now you can see I have seven rectangle elements with the class bar in my SVG. If you don't know uh, what is happening here, I suggest you watch the first episode of uh, this series where I explain the general update pattern in D3. So now I want to position my bars on the x-axis. For that, I want to add another attribute uh, with you know, the attribute x. And for that, I need the index value of that piece of data, which I am going to pass to our x scale. And like I said, x scale or the scale band is mapping arbitrary values to a range of uh, 0 to 300. And then you can, yeah, you can see the x values here. Then I want to add um, the width to my rectangles. I want the width to be, this is where the scale band comes in. I want it to be the bandwidth of that x scale. So like I said, the scale band is splitting the range of 0 to 300 into seven equally wide bands. And the bandwidth is equal to the width of that one band. And you can see that it is 42, around 42. And then, uh, because they're still not visible in my rectangles, I want to add another attribute, the attribute height, which I will just set to 50 so that we can see some bars. Well, yeah, we can see something, but they don't look like bars. And this is also where the scale band or the coolness of scale band comes in. I can add a padding to my scale band of 0 0.5, for example, and it will automatically add an outer and an inner padding, and it also automatically adjust the, um, the x-axis. And you can see now I have seven equally wide bars in my SVG and they're aligned with the ticks on my x-axis. Pretty cool, huh? So now I want to give my bars the right y and height attributes. For that, I will start with the y attribute like this. And here I can just pass the y scale, which will transform the values of my data array to their respective uh, y values, which is the top part of my rectangle, so to speak. So um, and in order to give them the right height, I have to uh, subtract the height. The y scale is basically generating here. Um, I have to subtract that height from my from the total height of my SVG. And that is 150. That is why I can say 150 minus y scale value. Yeah, now you can see we have a cool looking bar chart. And if you don't know or if you don't understand how this y scale works, I suggest you watch the previous two videos. So now if I press update data, the data will change and the bars will grow, which is great. But how do I animate this? Um, the way this works is you add another line here called transition, like so. And if I save this, actually nothing will animate yet because you have to define what you animate or what you want to animate after, the, um, after this transition call. So if I save this, you will see that they are animating, but kind of from the wrong end. 
This happens because uh, the origin of each rectangle is in the top left corner, just like with the SVG. So the width of a rectangle goes to the right and the height goes to the bottom. And in order to fix that, we have to apply a little trick. What we need to do is basically flip our bars upside down. And to do that, I will add another attribute here. I, would, I will add a style here, actually. The style transform scale one minus one. And what this does is basically flip them upside down on the Y axis. And if I save this, bam, they're gone, but not far. They're actually here. And why is that? That is also an oddity of SVG. SVG transforms are always relative to this goddamn origin. And uh, that is why the, why the bars, which were here, are now like up here. That means we have to recalculate the positioning of our bars. And uh, you can see that if I press update data, they're animating in the right direction, but their uh, Y values are still off. And we can fix that quite easily. We just need to set the attribute Y to a fixed value minus 150, the, mi uh, the negative total height. And uh, yeah, that works. And the reason that works or why this works is if I comment out this scaling, this upside down flipping, you can see that the bars look like this before they are getting um, flipped upside down. And if they do, they just look like this. So the last thing we're going to do in this session is to colorize our bars depending on the value each bar has. So that is fairly easy. It is actually just another linear scale. We're just going to copy this and call it a color scale. And instead of defining um, a numerical output value as I have defined here, I can just say I want to map 0 to 150 to green and red. So 0 will be green and 150 will be red. And if I now add this color scale to my bar by attaching it to an attribute fill uh, where I just pass the color scale. You can see oh, they look a bit odd, but they are actually colorized based on the value. Uh, they're actually not quite green and not quite red because uh, none of the values is 0 or 150. So I will now fix this coloring issue I have here. And uh, what I actually want is that I want to uh, make every bar which has a value of 75 or less, um, I want to make it green. And I want each bar to start turning red uh, the closer it gets to uh, 150. And uh, for that, I'm going to set the minimum value of my domain here to 75. So I'm mapping 75 to green. But uh, as you can see here, all of my bars which have a value of 75 or less have different green values. This happens because uh, values which go beyond this 75 negative, uh, like minimum value, that they are getting greener and values which actually go beyond this 150 value, they go even redder if it is possible. So um, we don't want that and we can fix that by adding another function here called clamp. True. And what this will do is it will make sure that values which go beyond 75 or which go beyond 150, that they still return these values we have defined here. As you can see here now. If I update my data, you can see that they're turning from green to brown, this ugly brown, and then finally to 150. And uh, how can we fix this like color transition from green to brown to red. The thing is, D3 or this linear interpolation is not perfect, but you can kind of guide it a bit by adding a third color here, for example, orange. And if I save this, you can see that 150 values will now actually be orange, but not red. This happens because we are mapping 75 to green and 150 to orange and basically nothing to red. And we can fix this by just adding another 
uh, value here, let's say 100 is going to be orange. And if you test this, you can see 100 is orange and 150 is red. And as you can also see, maybe you maybe noticed, the colors are not animating. Only the height is animating and the colors are just like swapping. And we can fix this by moving this attribute after the transition call. So if I now update the data, you can see it's like smoothly animating the color from green to orange to red. So that is it for this video. I hope you liked it. I hope it was a bit more interesting than the last one because I know it was a bit dry with the scales and axes. It was not uh, very visual, but I hope uh, this is a bit more interesting, a bit more useful. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about it. Hope to see you next time. Bye.